Okay, last class period, <clears throat> we introduced calculating the electric field due to a charge distribution. And you remember we did this problem with a circle, and at first we did it finding the electric field at the center of the circle, which at the end I said, well, by no surprise it was zero because of the symmetry. And so we could have at the very outset said, oh, it's zero due to symmetry and just moved on. But I wanted to show the method. Then I guess we didn't do it for a point that is not at the center, did we? I, at least I don't see it here. I, oh, yeah, okay, we did. So we did for a point that was not the center as well. Because Michael, well, not just because I was going to do it, but Michael asked, you know, what about a case where the symmetry doesn't make it zero? How do we do it then? So the steps we used in doing this were we need to integrate. First, we need to find what the charge distribution is. And so we're going to identify a little piece of charge, whether it's linear, a little length, or aerial, a little piece of area or volumetric, a little piece of volume. And then we use the charge density with the appropriate units there. And we calculate what the DQ is for that piece of charge. And then we go on to considering our geometry, set up a coordinate system and break the electric field DE produced by some little piece of charge DQ into its components. And then we integrate the X component, the Y component, the Z component as necessary, but we integrate them separately. So that's our method. So now I'm gonna to go to another problem. And this problem is essentially problem one. So if you look at your homework, did you bring your homework things that I gave you last time? If you look at problem one, Problem one says, a semi-infinite wire lies on the negative z axis from z equals zero to z equals minus infinity with constant linear positive charge density lambda. Determine the electric field at a point zero, zero, z along the positive z axis. Now the first thing that you're supposed to do with the problem is draw the figure. Um, and if you look at this, I said, consider the force in my problem. Your homework problem says the electric field. What's the difference in the force on a point charge and the electric field at a point? And, and this is actually a really important question. It's very simple in answer, but it's important to make sure we know what we're doing. What's the difference in finding, let, let's take away the calculus What's the difference in having Q1 here and lowercase q here and find force on Q versus find electric field at point P, I'll name the point, What's the difference in those two questions? If you're just doing it without calculus. Well, we're, we're doing without worrying about calculus at this point. Just do simple. They are different, but it's the difference that is the key. Needs to be between that, uh, a and yeah, what, what, what is, you can either say what the equation for E is and what the equation for F is, or you can, you know, just say what the difference is between E and F for the calculation.
Okay, so that's the electric field, and what's the force? It's the same force. Right, so the difference is that. So this problem says consider the force. If you do the force, you're going to have the charge Q1 in your calculation. If you do the electric field, it's exactly the same calculation, just without the charge Q1 for, for this, this problem's definitions of Q1 and Q2. So this problem asks for force. The homework problem asks for electric field. Because I'm doing this the second week now instead of the first week, I'm just going to go ahead and change this to the electric field. So it's the same as your problem. So now let's look at our problem. You have two variations, variation A and variation B. So variation A, you have a semi-infinite wire and it's a straight line. So variation B has the same thing. But in variation A, you have point P is at 0, comma, 0, comma, Z. And in variation B, you have point P is at, and what did I call it there? X. So the difference is where the point is between A and B. So which one do you think is easier, part A or part B? One of them is definitely easier, by the way. Why is one easier? Aren't they the same? They're just there's a significant easier for part A because in part A, what direction is your electric field? Notice in the problem you have specific instructions and instruction number one is um, Roman numeral I, draw a sketch, use a ruler, include the wire, the X and Z axes and the point P at which you're planning to find the electric field. Can you make an educated guess as to the direction of the electric field? So I need to make sure that I don't forget to put on here. That's my X direction. That's my Z direction. And note this wire continues on forever. So I'm going to put arrow at the bottom to indicate that it goes on forever. So there my pictures are accurate. And what direction is the electric field? Now notice it tells us that it's a positive charge density lambda that is on this wire. So what direction does the electric field point due to a positive charge? Outward. So in this case, at point P, what direction corresponds to outward? Up. So I'm going to have DE is pointing like that. And that's part of what you have to do for Roman numeral I is to show that DE. Now let's look over here at part B. For part B, what direction is outward going to be? Let, let's, let's take a piece here. I'm just going to take some random piece here. This random piece will have length DZ. And what direction is the electric field due to this piece? I should have done the same thing here. Well, you said it's going outward. So what direction is outward? from that charge 
at this point. What direction is outward? That way. Yeah, that way. And so my DE vector is going to point like this. Now let's be a little more clear. If I had chosen my, I'm going to do undo to get rid of this. If I had chosen that point, then I would have had it in this direction. And if I had chosen a point infinitely down on the wire because the line goes on forever, then I would have had that direction. Because the electric field always points away from positive charge. So the electric field due to that one little piece that I chose is pointing the direction of my arrow. And if I chose a piece at the top, it would have been pointing straight to the right. If I chose a piece way down at the bottom, it would have been pointing straight up. What was your question, Michael? Okay. Um, there is an undo button here somewhere. <sighs> Boo, where is it? I used to have it over here and apparently I've gotten rid of it. Well, life is cruel and hate. Oh, here it is. Must have changed with an update then. Okay. So the reason B is harder is because we had two component directions involved. We had both the X direction and the Z direction. And once again, I do need to put my x and z direction indicators otherwise i can't use x and z so b is going to be the harder one because it has two directions involved instead of just one so i'm going to cut this one off and work on part a so our process is first we need to identify which type of distribution this at and then, of course if you look in your instructions you have, um, first, what ideas will you use to determine E? Hmm. What's the name of the law that gives us the force between two-point charges? Coulomb's law. And you just take Coulomb's law and divide by one of the point charges, and it gives you the electric field, and we're using the integral form of Coulomb's law. So you would say for Roman numeral two, I'm going to use Coulomb's law because, and at this point, you don't have a good because because we haven't learned how to differentiate between when we should use Coulomb's law and when we should use a law we haven't learned yet, Gauss's law. So at this point, I'll say, just say you're going to use Coulomb's law. After we learn Gauss's law, you can come back and give you a reason why you chose Coulomb's law. Because right now it's just, well, it's the only way we know. Okay, so there's... Roman numeral two, Roman numeral three on the sketch of part that we already drew, indicate the infinitesimal small element you'll use. I've done that. Um, is a small element a line, an area, or volume? So I'd say DZ is a line. And then Roman numeral four, what's the electric field magnitude and direction due to the infinitesimally small element identified can be resolved into X and Y components? So for Roman numeral four, that's where I've got my first real work. So for Roman numeral four, I need, well, DE is by definition KDQ over R squared. That's just a definition. And furthermore, we know that it's all in the plus Z direction. So I can put a Z hat here and a vector sign there or break it into DEZ equals KDQ. That's a Q instead of a DQ. Over R squared, DEX equals DEY equals zero. But now I need to substitute what is DQ and what is R squared. Nathan. Okay, the charge didn't change. What we're doing is we have to add up all of the little bits of charge on that wire. And so that entire wire has a charge distribution on it. 
And so DQ is a little piece of the charge. And now you're going to add up the electric field due to each one of those pieces of charge. So DQ is holding the spot that Q was. It's just, it's a really tiny Q. That's why it's a DQ instead of Q. So what's the difference between doing that and just um, taking Q? The difference is Q is spread out. And so the R is changing for different parts of Q. So you cannot just use Q. That equation only works if you have a point charge, a charge at a point. Okay. If it's spread out, it doesn't work. With the exception being, because if you have spherical symmetry, you can treat it as if all the charges at the center. Yeah. And so that's, you can treat it as, not it is. Okay, but now we need to take this and we have two things. What is dq? Well, we've already specified that this, and this was one of the things you had to already answer. It's a linear charge distribution. So dq is going to be the charge per unit length multiplied by the element of length, which we already specified as dz. So I'm going to substitute that in for dq. And then I also need to substitute for r. What does R mean in our equation? R is not the length of the wire. Distance. It's the distance from the point we're calculating the electric field to where the charge DQ is. So in my picture, R is that distance. Now I'm going to make a change every year. I promise myself I'm going to make this change before I give you guys the homework. And every year I forget. I need to do it after class so I don't forget. Having this as Z is very poor. I'm going to call that A instead of Z. And likewise, instead of X, I'm going to call that B. It just makes my life easier having something that we understand to be a constant. Because I have Z as a variable and Z as a constant at the same time. That's really bad form, right? So I'm going to call that A and B instead of Z and X. I didn't write the original, so I can't take full blame. I just should have updated it. So if I want to calculate R, what is R? There's no D's in the R value. Oh, okay. So then it should be that point. Okay, we know it's a distance. Okay, I can't draw it there because I put an equal sign. We know it's a distance A from here to here. The distance from here to here is minus z. Why minus z? Because that's in the negative z area. So that means the total distance is a minus z. Where we understand z is always a negative number. So it's actually a magnitude bigger than a. Well, yes, when we substitute these in, so um, let's see, just to make sure I have this right. Can we resolve into X and Y components? Yes, yes. Okay, so now we set up our integral expression. So that was Roman numeral four. Now Roman numeral five is to set up our integral expression. So I have EY equals EX equals zero. I don't need to show an integral expression. Integral of zero equals zero. That's kind of futile. <laughs> but what I do need to do is write that out and then have EZ is equal to the integral of DEZ. What are the limits for this integral? Yeah. 
a to well it's from from minus c to a. yeah it's from z equals minus infinity to zero because that's the extent of the wire right the, the, we're going to shift so it matches i think what you said chad because it makes our calculation much simpler to shift so it's going to be from minus infinity to zero well, DE so I plugged in lambda DZ for DQ and A minus Z for R. And now we just have to do this integral. And what I say we're going to do to make the integral easier. Okay, one thing is we'll bring out the constants. So I brought out the constants. By the way, doing the integral is actually part six. <laughs> so I'm doing five and six together here, drawing the integral and then, or writing out the integral expression, then doing it. What's the next step for solving this integral? Well, before you do that, you want to do U substitution. Let u equal a minus z. So du is equal to minus dz. And your integral becomes ez equals k lambda. Put the minus sign there from the minus dz. And then I've got to figure out my limits. So my lower limit was z equals minus infinity so what is a minus z when z is equal to minus infinity it's infinity and what is a minus z when z is equal to zero so there's my limits now it's not that hard of an integral What's the integral of du over u squared? Now this is where you use the power rule, like you said, Nate. You divide by the new power. So now a minus and a minus is a plus. So that's k lambda times the upper limit, 1 over a, minus the lower limit, look, that wasn't very tough, was it? It wasn't very, OK. Trust me, when we do part B, you'll say, yes, that wasn't very tough. Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, that's the right, that's the right attitude, Nate. Uh -oh. That wasn't very tough in terms of the integral. What was tough was you have to remember to do this process. On the first exam, you're going to have a problem that either requires you to do a process like this or a process like Gauss's law that we're going to learn maybe later on today. So you, get, you have to learn the steps to be able to apply them. So reviewing the steps, they're very carefully put in there. You have to do so much in doing these problems because he wanted to see that you understood what the steps were. So the first thing you do is, of course, draw a careful picture. Without a careful picture, you're sunk. Then you identify what your little piece of charge is going to be. In this case, it was charge spread out over line. So my little piece 
had, was a length piece. And then I calculated what dq was. dq is the charge per unit length times the d length, in this case dz. Then identify what direction dE is going to be due to that little piece of charge. Break it into components, integrate each component direction. Now we've gone through one, I've specified the steps, we'll do part B now. So that is part A, that's the answer for part A. The process is important, if you just have the answer, you know, that's a very small amount of the credit. And if you look on Moodle, you'll see my rubric about how the credit is distributed through the problem, so you know. And basically, if it says three points for this section, there's probably three important things I'm looking for in that section. So now let's go to part B. Now part B, I drew my picture here already. And so I'm going to do one thing on this before, before I go to the next slide, and that is break my electric field into components. Okay, I don't have room to write DEZ there, so I'm going to do it like that. And my arrow was a bad, bad place. So I've got my DEX and my DEZ. How do those relate to DE overall? What would you typically do? To break it into components. What do you typically do to break a vector into components? You what? Use trig. Use trig. Yeah. I heard string. <laughs> okay, so we need to define an angle. So the first thing I'm going to do is define this angle as theta, which makes this angle here theta. And then using trig, which trig function goes with dex? Cosine. So dex is de cosine theta. And which one goes with dez? Sign. So I need to find my DE, and then I'll use cosine and sine to break it up into components. I, <laughs> Traditionally, I have had problems, but I'm going to try to copy this and paste the entire thing on the next page. Oh, I know I have problems. Uh, I have to do it again because the key I needed to press was underneath that. Okay. Uh, duplicate. Is that going to work? Nope. Control X to delete. Make it disappear. <laughs> Didn't disappear. Well, control copy, the delete button. I made it disappear. Please work. Control paste. Yay! All right. So here's my picture. Now I have more space. I can actually put D E Z over here now. What is the magnitude of D E of D E? What's the equation? DE is equal to? <laughs> no, no. We need it in terms of K, Q, and R. Well, K, D, Q, and R. Okay. 
DQ um, over R squared. Okay. Over R squared. I need to find what DQ is. What will DQ be? Right. Because it's a linear piece. Once again, you have the question. Is it a line? Is it an area or a volume? Because it's a line, it's lambda dz. Now, in general, lambda doesn't have to be constant. In these introductory problems, lambda is constant. In later problems in this assignment, you're going to have volume instead of line, and you're going to have the charge density changes with radius. Um, DQ is lambda DZ. The little piece of charge is equal to the charge between the length times the little piece of light. I think it's that's D. D. Oh, that's yeah. D. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah. it's, oh, you're, you're asking about the... It's just D scribble. It's not a scribble? Not that one. Oh, not that one? What are you talking about there? Oh, that's that's, that's that perfectly good. legible in my world. Is that better? Or is it equal? <laughs> okay, good. We'll move on. I, I'm sorry. I do want you to read. Don't don't get me wrong. Okay, so we have DQ now in terms of DZ. What about R? Nathan has a question. So, so lambda is the charge density. That's correct. Okay, so what is R? Mm -hmm. So it would be D. Right, R is this distance right here. Yeah, plus going down. What, what part of the triangle would we call that? Hypotenuse. hypotenuse. And how do we find the hypotenuse? Yeah. So R is just the square root of. The top side is B, right? I replaced the X with the B. And then the vertical is technically it's minus Z. No one cares because it's squared. Well, no. The distance from here to here is all that matters, not if it's positive or negative. So there's R. Yeah, that's the entire R. So if I put those in, I'd have DEX is equal to K lambda DZ cosine theta. Well, now I have two variables. I have theta and I have Z. What should I do at this point? I need to get it to one variable. That's right. There's more than one way to skin this cat. There's an easier way and a harder way. I don't think I've ever done it the harder way. The easier way, though, is tricky. I guess. Well, no, no, no. we could use, this is the hard way. The hard way is cosine theta is B over R. So B, oh, oh, I forgot. It's R squared, so that square root sign disappears. B over square root of B squared plus Z squared. So I could put that in, and then I have it just in terms of Z.
Now, is that a doable integral? You have integral tables and you can do it. What we traditionally do is something else. Something else because it turns out to be really easy after we go through the complicated steps. So what we do is we say, okay, check this out. Tangent theta is equal to the opposite side. That's minus Z divided by the adjacent side, which is B. So if that's tangent theta, then if I take the derivative of both sides, the right side's easy. The derivative of B is a constant, so that just comes out. The minus and the over B stays. And I have DZ. So that, that was easy. What about the derivative of tangent theta? It's d theta over cosine squared theta. And so I can replace my z, my dz with something that has d theta and cosine theta. But then I still have the z in the bottom, right? The b squared plus z squared. And what do I do with that? Well, I know that um, that cosine theta is equal to B over, I'm going to simplify my life and return this to over R squared. <laughs> it's just simpler. And since cosine theta is B over R, then I can just say that R is equal to b over cosine theta. So I'm going to substitute this for r, and this here, if I if I solve it for dz, don't forget the minus sign, substitute that for dz. And so when I make that substitution, just zooming out so I can fit everything on one screen, I have DE is K lambda DZ over R squared is equal to K lambda. And for DZ, I'm substituting minus B D theta over cosine squared theta divided by R squared. So that's going to be B over cosine theta quantity squared. Now that's just DE, that's not DEX or DEY, just DE. But what's gonna simplify here? Um, so can you just back up one second? Yeah. Um, so how did you, how again did we think to use tangent? <laughs> that takes creativity. I didn't think to do that. Somebody else did. And I said, wow, you're a genius. That's how we thought about it. Do we have to think of these things as we go along? This is something that you learn as a trick. Just like you've learned lots of other tricks in calculus. Okay, so how do you know? Like, how did you know when to use that trick? <laughs> how did I know when to use it? I know when to use it when I have this particular problem. <laughs> um, okay, so. In other words, I don't use it very often, probably once per year. So, yeah, you, you may use that specifically for the purpose of planning of substituting it for DZ. Yeah. And since I only use it once per year, just in case I had a problem, there it is. I didn't have to look at my hand, but right, I don't have it memorized. It's a trick. Yes, Trace. Also, I understand that we replaced, you know, on the bottom we have the O squared theta uh, for the. Where are you talking about? A little bit for the. Uh, the D. Yeah. Why isn't O cubed on the other Over side? Over here, because, um, because cosine theta was B over R. Oh, uh, okay. And so there's a B on top and, and the R, additional R on bottom. So 
So we're not using this one at all. But that was one process we could have done. It's, and it's not super hard, but it's less elegant. This here is more complicated, but easier to do. Yeah, that's just D. And so I'm going to put it in for DEX and for DEY after we're, we've done simplifying. So if I want to simplify this, what can I do to simplify it? Okay, I can get rid of, well, let, let's, Let's be very pedantic. I'm going to rewrite this, taking away the square. And putting the individual items squared. Now we can see what we have to do. Okay. What, what's going to happen is one of the Bs is going to cancel, right? The reason I expanded is so we can see just one of those and both of the cosines. So what we're left with is so what we're left with is that. Now, this suddenly is real easy, right? So that means that DX, -E I wrote a Z, and DEZ, uh, K, Lambda, And so if I want to find EX, by the way, what is DEY? In this problem, DE is in the X and Z direction. So what's DEY? Zero, Zero right. Did I use a Y instead of a Z? Oh, you are right. Well, that's okay. embarrassing because I probably did that twice. No, you did it once copy it. Oh, I was, I was saying I probably did it here as well, but I, I did that one right. Thank you, Trace. <laughs> yeah. Come on, man. It's hard enough without making mistakes. All right. So now we just have to do these integrals. So EX equals minus K lambda over B integral cosine theta D theta. And I need the limits. Oh, the limits. What angles am I going through? If z equals zero, what is theta? Theta is going to be zero. So I'm going to start at an angle of zero. And if Z goes to minus infinity, what is theta? It's, it's nine degrees or pi over two. So I'm going from zero to pi over two. Okay, you guys are all mathematical geniuses, right? What's the integral of cosine theta? Now, is that a positive or a negative sine theta? Okay. I always have to go through that every time. And so when we put our limits, what's sine of pi over 2? Now we see I have a problem. 
I have minus K lambda over B. What do we know the answer is? It's pointing up and to the right. So it should be positive. So somewhere in here, I made the hated sign error. Where did I make that hated sign error? I don't know. Derivative cosine is negative sine. So the integral of, sine of cosine is positive. Yeah, you're right on the signs there. Somewhere I made an error in my signs. And those kinds of errors be double me. <laughs> right? I made a mistake. I, I would be willing to bet it has something to do with how I define my limits. Like, oh, wait, I should have gone. In fact, this is what it is now that I think about it. I should have gone from minus infinity to zero. And if I'd gone from minus infinity to zero, that would have got, corresponded to going from pi over two to zero. This is where I made my mistake. And so that would have made it, well, negative zero minus, yeah. Well, the negative is for this sign right here. Right, it doesn't matter. So it's parentheses negative zero. My, okay, that's a parenthesis, not an absolute value sign. <laughs> minus parentheses. It's not, it's not, <laughs> minus k lambda over b. And so that's equal to the positive k lambda over b. So that's my x component. What about the y component? I appreciate you. Keeping me correct. Yeah, it's zero. Moving on. <laughs> I try not to. In fact, remember in class yesterday, I twice said, trick question alert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's the integral of sine theta? Okay, this time we got our signs all straight. So it's minus... K lambda over B times minus cosine theta. So we put in our upper limit. Cosine of zero is one. And we get K lambda over B minus and cosine of pi over two is zero. And so we have EY equals K lambda over B. Doggone it. I am really, really in a groove here. Not the right groove, but in a groove. It's like you're bowling. I'm totally in the gutter. It's keeping it straight. Okay, so there we have our components. And so finishing it out, E vector is equal to K lambda over B. X hat plus, watch that, Z hat. Boom! I did it right. Whereas for the previous problem, I should have written out my final E vector equal K lambda over A in the Z direction. So we have gone through and we have done all of the steps necessary for problem one. I did not write down all of the words you need. Make sure you go through, and for each step, you write down the words, because it's asking you to write down explanations for most of this. So make sure you go through and do that, and don't just have the math and say, there you go, I got it. Right? Because what I want to see is that you understand what you were doing, not just could replicate the math. Any questions about these two halves of the problem? Okay. And, oh, you know, I didn't upload last week's. Well, this is still on last week. So I'll upload it after today so you can look on Moodle and see it. 
What were the steps that I took? What's the first thing? Okay, the first thing was the drawing. Okay, let's. You yeah. can't forget that. After I drew my very careful drawing, what was the first thing I did? Identify. Yeah, I identified the x and z directions. Okay, I identified the x and z directions. Okay, for this problem, yeah, I, I can say that part. Well, you identify what's changing, what's not, or I mean, what's what's being added up. This Actually, that that's in the right ballpark. I identified what my little piece DQ was. Yeah. If it's a linear segment or a an aerial segment or a volumetric segment. And then I calculated what DQ is based on the geometry. So this problem was all one dimensional. So I just had DQ was equal to lambda DZ. If it had been two dimensional, I would have had DQ is equal to, I think I put there mu instead of sigma, um, DX DY for a little you know, two dimensional area. And like that. After I've identified what DQ is, what's the next step? Before I did R, I wrote down an equation with R in. Determined what DE is, the electric field, due to this little DQ. Then I had to determine what dr or what r was because it's part of that equation. So I did it in that order. If you did it the other order, no one's going to say, oh, you made a mistake, because you need it. Then break in components, integrate each component separately. Well, we've done a number of examples there. Let's look at a spherical one. And you know what? I didn't prepare this one at all. Um, charge uniformly distributed over spherical shell. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm not going to do it because of time. Um, holy cow, we're already over. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we yes, will <laughs> we will pick up here and learn Gauss's law next class period. Because this one here, you can do it without Gauss's law, but it's so much easier with Gauss's law. It's a what class? I was thinking, I, I think it's a 